Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman, and we're taking a look today at the Shuttle DH370. This is a mini PC that's not much larger than a CD-ROM drive might be, uh, but it allows you to install a desktop-class Coffee Lake Intel processor in this very small form factor, which might be appealing to some folks looking for a good amount of performance in a small amount of space. We're going to be taking a closer look at this in just a second, but I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that this is on loan from Shuttle. So when we're done with this, it goes back to them. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. Nobody is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get to it now and see what this PC is all about. So let's take a closer look now at the hardware. This costs $379 as a bare bones kit. So what that means is that you have to buy the CPU, the RAM, and the storage to make it into a complete computer. Uh, so this will cost you a little bit as you start assembling components. It will support any of the Coffee Lake generation Intel CPUs. Uh, so that can include an i3, i5, or an i7. And I also believe there's a Celeron option uh, in that processor lineup as well. As you can see, it is very compact inside, uh, and that will represent, I think, an issue for cooling and fan noise, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the video. You've got a huge heat sink, though, here on the CPU, and these fans, of course, will push that air uh, up through the top of the case. It's all metal. It feels like a desktop PC case, but it's in a very tiny little form factor here. Uh, you do have two RAM slots here. It takes DDR4 RAM. You can bring it up to 32 gigabytes if you want. Uh, this one, as currently configured, has 8 gigs, uh, and it also has an i5-8500 processor, which is a 6-core processor. Uh, now, on the RAM, I do recommend installing the RAM in pairs, uh, so that way you'll get the most performance out of this, because single-channel RAM does not push data as fast as uh, dual-channel does. So get a pair of RAM sticks if you are looking at getting one of these things. Now you'll notice here on the top, there's a SATA SSD installed, one of these lower cost uh, uh, WD green drives. Uh, you can also put in an M2 SATA drive into the package if you want, but uh, you gotta put that drive in before you assemble your CPU and everything because the M2 slots are covered up by the heatsink here. Uh, there is a type M key and a type E key. And for storage, it will support an NVMe drive or an M2 SATA drive. But again, it's going to be a hassle to swap those out because you will have to redo your thermal paste every time you want to get at those drives, which are underneath the heat sink. Uh, here's an image of what the motherboard looks like so you can get a feel for how everything is laid out. Uh, they definitely made a good use of the space that they had, and there's not a lot of room in there, which is why uh, that heat sink has to be taken off to get at those slots. As for other I.O., there's quite a bit. You've got audio in, audio out here, your power button, a full-size SD card slot, and then you've got two sets of USB ports here on the front. Uh, these red ones are USB 3.1 Gen 2 slots, which can run at up to 10 gigabits per second. Next to them are the slower uh, 3.0 USB ports that run at 5 gigabits per second maximum. Uh, you can mount the entire unit here on a visa mount if you want. I did not see a mounting plate in the box, so I'm assuming that might cost a little bit extra, so you may have to research that, uh, but it might be a nice little form factor for putting on the back of a monitor or something like that. And it also looks like you could probably rack mount it here too with the screws on the side. Now in the back, we've got even more I.O. We've got the power input here for the plug, and we'll talk about power consumption a little later. You have HDMI out here along with two DisplayPort outs. Uh, so you can drive three independent displays at up to 4K at 60 hertz each. So that's pretty nice. We tested that a little bit earlier. You have two old school serial ports here on the back. I think one thing that these computers often find themselves in are industrial and commercial applications that have some serial control. So they uh, bake those serial ports right in there. And you can also, of course, connect up your old school mice if you want to it as well. You have two gigabit Ethernet ports here on the back. So this might work well as some kind of security firewall or something like that if you wanted to explore that as well. On the back here, we've got two more sets of USB ports. Again, a Gen 2 set and a regular USB 3 set. And then this little thing here is for uh, remote power control. I think this is for a power switch. If you have this thing installed somewhere and you can't get at the power switch uh, on the actual device, I think you can run an, ex oops, an extension, <laughs> if you don't drop it first, uh, an extension out to power it up. So that is the overall hardware. 
Uh, let's take a look now and see how it performs. The nice thing about being in a solid state world right now is that usually dropping it like that doesn't damage anything. Let's take a look and see what this thing can do. So we'll kick things off with my YouTube channel here running a 1080p 60 video. No problems there, no drop frames, everything looked good. Uh, we also went over to the nasa.gov homepage and we also had a very good experience browsing the web on this, very snappy and responsive, which is what you would expect out of the six core processor they put in here. Uh, note that this does not come with Wi-Fi either. It is bare bones. Uh, See, so we'll have to add your own Wi-Fi card to the mix, but we connected up via that gigabit ethernet in the back. And on the browserbench.org speedometer test, we got a very good score of 194.1 on the 1.0 version of that test. 109.2 on version 2.0. And then I compared this to a few other uh, mini desktop PCs we've looked at in the recent months here, uh, all running mobile processors. And you can see this one does perform a lot better than those do because it's running with a full desktop Intel processor. Now, of course, your mileage will vary depending on what chip you put inside of it, but I think an i5 chip here is a good uh, balancing point here between the uh, lower cost i3 and Celerons and the i7 you might want above it. So all in, good performance. And of course, Microsoft Word will run fine on here too. We've got it running at 4K here. This is what separates this channel. Most people play games at 4K. We do Microsoft Word at 4K, uh, but really no problems getting uh, all of your work done on this PC if you're just looking for a general purpose device. So let's move on now to see how it does with games. I don't think it's going to do very well because you don't have any GPU options here. Uh, there's no way to add an external GPU because it lacks Thunderbolt. That was a disappointment. And of course, you can't fit a GPU in here even if it had a slot for one. So you're going to be limited to the Intel graphics only. So we'll kick things off with Rocket League. And if you run everything on the high performance mode, basically the lowest settings, you'll get about 60 to 80 frames per second, give or take provided you've got the dual channel memory installed inside the computer. If you only have single channel RAM, you'll see lower performance. So again, that pairing of RAM is really critical for graphics performance on this. Uh, we also ran Half-Life 2, which is an older game. Uh, that one did much better, of course. We got around 110 to 130 frames per second, uh, high settings at 1080p. I think that's kind of the sweet spot for these kind of machines is the older games from about eight to 10 years ago and back. Uh, so that might be the target you should be looking for here. Now this machine might be a good target for emulation. We're running uh, Star Wars Rogue Leader on the Dolphin emulator right now. It's getting a little laggy here or there, but I think it's just a matter of tweaking things. But by and large, I'm getting 60 frames per second out of Star Wars here, which is often a very unforgiving game uh, on the Dolphin emulator, and it's very, very playable here. So I think other games would run better. Uh, you're going to be limited by the Intel hardware here, but I think there's going to be a lot of emulators that will run quite well if you pair up a, a decent uh, Intel processor like the i5 I have in here. And I think because of its small form factor, it might work really well in an arcade cabinet or uh, plugged into a TV in a rec room or something like that. And on the 3D Mark CloudGate test, we got a score of 9,025. And you'll see the graphics performance here isn't much better than some of the other computers we've looked at in the past with prior generation Intel chips. But uh, what we are seeing is better CPU performance because this particular i5 has a six core CPU. So that is giving us better physics scores. Uh, but really this is again, not a gaming machine for most of the AAA titles that are out there. Uh, but again, there are applications where the graphics performance on this will be good enough mainly the old stuff or emulation as we've mentioned here. Now let's move on now to its thermal performance. We ran the 3D Mark stress test on this, which runs a benchmark over and over again to see if the computer uh, throttles itself under load due to heat. Uh, there we got a failing grade of 93.7%. So the performance will likely fluctuate a little bit uh, when you put the computer under extended load. Uh, that would include activities like video encoding and rendering and things that really will uh, tax the processor over an extended period of time. Uh, the case will also get pretty warm to the touch, nothing to be alarmed about, but it does uh, require some ventilation to work effectively. Uh, you're also going to hear the fans quite a bit, especially when you are taxing that processor. Those fans are not quiet. We also measured power consumption. Uh, we were getting about 20 to 22 watts of power at idle. Uh, and then when we put it under load, we were looking at about 90 watts or so. Uh, so of course, if you want something that you can kind of turn on and have running in the background and not consume all that much power, 
uh, some of the lower power Gemini Lake PCs that we've looked at quite a bit here on the channel might be the better choice. Some of those sit idle at around 7 watts, so you are certainly going to be paying a little bit of a power penalty uh, here when you uh, look at one of these desktop class uh, Intel devices. All right, let's move on now to Kodi and Home Theater. Uh, it does do okay with HEVC files. That 140 megabit jellyfish test file is what you're seeing on screen right now, but uh, it doesn't do very well at all with lossless audio because it doesn't support it. So I was not able to get uh, any of my Blu-ray movies to play back properly, at least insofar as their audio is concerned, uh, due to the fact that at the moment, at least, the HDMI on this device just doesn't support those lossless formats. I'm guessing they could probably do a BIOS update to improve that situation, but as it is now, uh, I can't recommend this one as a home theater device because of those audio issues. I don't believe this will work with HDR video either. Uh, that's one area that Windows has been lacking on is HDR support, uh, especially for some of the things that we do here with home theater on the channel. So right now, I don't think it's a good choice for home theater watchers. But as you can see, it is running Linux, and we have Ubuntu 18.10 working here at 4K. Uh, so the video is working properly. Audio was detected. Uh, the Ethernet is working. So I think this is a probably a good option for uh, running your Linux devices. They do have Linux support mentioned in the marketing materials as well, so they have thought about people looking at running open source operating systems on it, and altogether, I think if you are looking for a Linux PC, this will probably work well for you. Just note, though, that if you buy a Bluetooth or a Wi-Fi radio, you'll need to get one that is Linux compatible. Uh, because remember, it doesn't have one built in. So altogether, I like the form factor they've put together here, especially given that you can put in a regular desktop Coffee Lake processor and get desktop performance out of it, something that you might see on a much larger device. So if you're looking for something in a commercial or industrial application, uh, this might be something worth considering given that you don't really have a lot of sacrifices here when it comes to overall CPU performance. Uh, it's not great for home theater, it's not great for gaming, but it might be something that those of you looking to build an emulation station might want to consider given that a bulk of the emulators you'll run on it most likely uh, don't need tremendous graphical horsepower and the small form factor here might fit very well uh, with a cabinet or something you might be putting together. But it's not a slam dunk. Uh, primarily because of the fan noise, the uh, home theater support, and its lack of Thunderbolt. So hopefully we'll see something similar like this that might include some of those things that might be more appealing to uh, enthusiasts like myself. But I think if you are, again, uh, understanding what the limitations are of the package here, I think it will work well in specific applications. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Chris Allegretta, the Four Guys with Quarters podcast. Tom Albrecht. Anuj Zaveri. And Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.